This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Well, back in Chapter 2, we saw how we put together the income tax computation for the taxpayer for us for our tax year, the 2021-22 tax year. What we now see from Chapter 3 all the way through to Chapter 9 is how we establish what figure of those different sources of taxable income to include on that income tax computation for our tax year. Here, as you see in Chapter 3, the main focus of attention of this chapter is property income. That is one of the three main types of uh, non-savings income that we saw again back in Chapter 2. The other forms of non-savings income that we have, trading income, and that's going to occupy, as we said in our original introduction to income tax, that's going to occupy a lot of chapters here. From chapter 4 all the way through to chapter 8, we'll be dealing with issues that pertain to the taxation of the unincorporated trader, the individual, the sole trader, the partner in a partnership, the unincorporated business. How do we establish the amount of profit to be assessed in relation to that trader for our particular tax year? And in chapter 9, we look at employment income. The other big one, of course, in terms of non-savings income and the other type of uh, income that we get from work that we do. You're either an employee or you're self-employed. Now, although it's only got one chapter as compared to what five chapters on trading income, it's still a big chapter. And again, what we'll discover, as we've spoken of briefly before, is that when we deal with employment income, we've got more than just a salary or wage. There's a whole range of benefits that an employer, if he or she was so minded, could provide any employee with. And we have to recognise those that are exempt from those that are taxable. And if they are taxable, what is the basis of such taxation? That awaits us uh, in a while yet, up in Chapter 9. So here, therefore, we focus, probably 90% of this chapter is to deal with property income and just a little bit to deal with investment income, mostly interest income that will be discussed there right at the end <coughs> Pardon me, of this chapter. So property income. Now, when we think about property income, the obvious first thought is we're talking about rental income. We have got usually a separate uh, property to the one in which we live, though we will see later it is possible to rent out a part of the property in which you live, and that's got some special rules unto itself. But usually the situation that we're dealing with is the taxpayer might be fortunate enough to have one or more properties that they rent out. The ambition, of course, to gain rental income, to make a profit on the ownership of that property in terms of the income outweighing what will be the expenses that we incur to generate that rental income. So the main issue, of course, is about that rental income. And as it says here, the following income is liable, accessible as property income, the rental income. That, of course, will not just be the rental income, it will be the income less the allowable expenses. And that, as we'll see when we move to our next chapter four and deal with the unincorporated trader and establish what will be the tax adjusted trading profit to assess on that trader for our particular tax year? It's usually the expenses area where we have most of the difficulty. I say difficulty simply in terms of there's more to learn there. The income is usually a straightforward issue, but it's working out what will be the amount of allowable expense to be able to deduct from income. It is true here when dealing with property income is particularly true in the next chapter, chapter four, that deals with establishing an adjusted trading profit that is acceptable for taxation purposes. But as well as the rents that we may get under any lease or tenancy agreement that the tenant or the lessee has, there may also be a one-off receipt by the lessor, the person who owns the property, when they receive a premium when they grant a short lease to a lessee, to a tenant there. Now, that again awaits us after we've dealt with the 
majority of the learn, learning part of this chapter, which is to deal with the rental income assessment. So we have the ongoing rental income, and we may have a one-off premium that is received up front at the start of the lease when it is granted, that we also have to bring in as an income assessment. But more of that later. In terms of the basis of assessment, well, we've seen an important change. It took place some years ago, as we'll see in these notes, as regards the basis of assessment. Income from land and buildings are property income prior to the 1819 tax year, so up until the 1718 tax year, was computed for individuals as if the letting of property was a business, as we'll see in Chapter 4 when we look at the trading part. And the amount assessable in the tax year, the amount assessable was computed as the rental income accrued less the allowable expenses incurred i.e. we use the accruals basis, a basis which I trust you are more than familiar with from your financial accounting studies. But thankfully, it is likely that in our exam we will only have to deal with the simple system that came in prior, uh, sorry, since that point in time. So from 1819, we work on a simple cash basis. Now we say there it's usually applied and will be assumed to apply in an exam question unless it's specifically stated to the contrary. Now why might we have to revert from the cash basis so we simply look at 6th of April start of tax year to 5th of April at the end of the tax year and look at the dates that any rental income was received during that tax year. Why might we revert to the accruals basis where we're looking at the uh, rental income receivable in terms of that tax year and the allowable expenses incurred for that year. This will arise under either of two situations. A taxpayer may choose to use the accruals basis, but we will assume without any other guidance that that has not happened and therefore the cash basis applies. But must use the accruals basis where the property income receipts exceed 150,000. That's a very big number. If you've got that level of rental income, this is a business, and therefore the business, the accrual system, will apply. You don't have any choice in that matter. Therefore, on the cash basis, the assessment will now be, quite obviously, the rental income received and the allowable expenses paid. It's a received and paid basis. That means, as ever, you have to read the question carefully as to see indeed exactly when was any rental income received as compared to when it may have been due and in compared to the period to which it relates. And we'll see that in example one here, such that we're going to calculate the property income assessment for our 21-22 tax year and also compute the assessment if the taxpayer chose to use the accruals basis. So we look at the cash basis first of all, then just to make sure we don't have a problem with it, and thereafter we'll leave it alone, would we'll just show what the result would have been had the taxpayer chosen to use the accruals basis. So Jim bought a property and rented it out from, for the first time, 1st of July 21. So we are looking at the 21-22 tax year, so the date that the property was acquired and therefore the date from which any rental income may be received was the 1st of July. There's a rental of £6,000 per annum and that is paid and we've got to look at both systems here. So we've got to look at both the cash and the accruals. We've also got to look at, as we see now, when rental income is due it would normally be due in advance at the beginning of the period to which it relates. Now, the period to which it relates, it could be monthly and usually is in exam questions, or as here, as we'll see, it could be quarterly. It could even be in real life annually there. Now, normally it is in advance, and in this question, it's quarterly in advance. So three months worth of rent will be due in advance 
at the beginning of that quarter. Or secondly, quarterly in arrears. So it'll still be the same amount that is due to be received, but it won't be received, of course, until the end of that quarterly rental period, rather than at the beginning. So, in relation to the start of this, the lease began on the 1st of July 21. Very clearly, therefore, the rental income will be received. We'll assume that the due date is also the received date, unless you are told to the contrary, that it would be received on the 1st of July, and then on the 1st of each quarterly month thereafter. So the 1st of July 21, the 1st of October 21, the 1st of January uh, 22, and the 1st of April 22. Now remember, we are interested in what was received between the 6th of April, the start of the tax year 2021, and the 5th of April 2022. And when I've gone through those dates, starting with the 1st of July on a payment in advance system, 1st of October, 1st of January, 1st of April 22, that's still in there. Whereas if it was quarterly in arrears, then we wouldn't get the due amount until the end of that quarter. Well, the quarter beginning on the 1st of July there would have ended the 30th of September. The 30th of September 21 is in our 21-22 tax year. The 31st of December 21 is in our 21-22 tax year. The 31st of March 22 is in our tax year. But that's it, because the next one isn't until the 30th of June 22, and that arises in the 22-23 tax year. So we've got to work out what rental income would be received on each of those two bases. Do it uh, again, separately, do the cash basis first of all, rental income and the allowable expenses, then move to the accruals basis, the rental income and the allowable expenses now on an incurred basis, an accruals basis. About those expenses, paid allowable expenses at £300 in November 21. So in the 21-22 tax year, it's paid, it's deductible, under the cash basis. That was for redecoration and £500 in May 22 for repairs completed in March 22. See what's going on here. On a cash basis, it wasn't paid. We didn't have to pay it until May 2022. That's not in the 21-22 tax year. Clearly, it's in the 22-23 tax year. But if we were working on the accruals basis, as you will secondly do, then the work was done in March 22, completed by March 22. So we'd incurred that expenditure within the tax year. So it would be included on the accruals basis. It won't be included for 21-22 on the cash basis. So what you've got to do, therefore, using firstly the cash basis and then the accruals basis, work out on the cash basis, rental income received, less allowable expenses paid. On the accruals basis, the rental income receivable in that period, and then the allowable expenses incurred for that period. Have a go at that, see what differential we get in our answers, and we'll discuss it therefore after you've looked at the model answer. So pause now please. OK, let's see what we've got here, therefore, in answer to this first example in Chapter 3, and firstly dealing with the cash basis. As we know, the cash basis has become oops, the cash basis has become the default setting for individuals, uh, whether that's an individual or a partner in a partner or a partnership indeed, in assessing property income. And that's replaced the accruals basis, though as we saw, the accruals basis may be elected for by the taxpayer or, of course, becomes compulsory should that rental income exceed £150,000. Now, the question here about the cash basis was, when was the cash due? Were we talking about the rent being payable in advance or in arrears? Usually, in real life, it would be in advance. You're not going to wait three months before you get the rent out of your tenant, just in case after three months he disappears before paying you anything at all. So it's usually in advance, but read the question. 
So on the basis that it is quarterly in advance here, that as we said, started on the 1st of July, then due 1st of October 21, 1st of January and 1st of April 22. 1st of April 22, just in there before or by the 5th of April 2022. So those amounts of cash received, that's four such quarterly uh, figures of £1,500 a quarter, because it was 6000 for the year. So we got all four, it's £6,000. Again, as you'll discover as you practice in this area, typically to make it more interesting in the exam question, as we state here, wasn't the case in this example, by the way, but typically in the exam question, you might be told, that the amount due on the 1st of April 22, therefore, if it was received on that date as it should have been, that means it was 2122 as we have it here. But if that was not received until, say, the 15th of April, anything from the 6th of April 22 onwards, then it was not received until the 2223 then uh, tax year. And that would mean that instead of having four such receipts during the tax year, we'd only have three of those four quarterly receipts. And that would have put it down to four and a half thousand pounds being received in the 21-22 tax year. So that's a typical way by which they can make the cash basis in relation to your rental income slightly more interesting anyway. So although you've got your due dates, that's when the cash should have come in Again, check, is it in arrears in advance? Did the, the cash come in on those dates? Look, if it's moved over from the end of a tax year to the start of the next tax year, such as we mentioned in that note. If we've been dealing with quarterly in arrears, then again, as we said on the introduction to the question, that means at the end of the first quarter, the 30th September, and then the 31st of December, 2021, and then just the 31st of March 22. That's three of your four quarterly payments, and that would amount to £4,500. Again, in an exam question, you might be told, as it said here, the amount due just before the end of the tax year, 31st of March 22 there, was not received until the 9th of April. That's after the 5th of April, and that therefore puts it into the 22 to 23 tax year. So only two of those quarterly payments would have actually have been received. So only 3,000 would be received and therefore assessed in 2122. So again, careful as it always must be reading of the question, is the rental income due in advance or in arrears to know the relevant dates to begin with? And then were those dates hit? Was the rental income received on the date it was due. And usually where it's going to be an issue is where it was due on one date, but didn't come into a later date, and the later date is in the next tax year, as we've discussed there. In terms of expenses, we're working on a paid basis, and £300 worth of allowed expenses were paid in November 21, and that will be the only allowable deduction for 21-22 as that repairs expenditure, although being incurred in 21-22, incurred, was not paid, which is what we're interested here, until the 22-23 tax year. So you're going to have to wait until the next tax year before you get relief for that expenditure that you incurred. If therefore the rental income is received quarterly in advance, the property income assessment will be £5,700 that being your full 6,000 for the four quarters that would have um, been due and it was received on those due dates, minus the amount of expense paid, that was 300. If the rental was received quarterly in arrears and was received on the due dates again, then that would have been four and a half thousand pounds of income, less again the 300 pounds expense paid, and that would have given you £4,200. Compare that with the accruals basis. The accruals basis, it doesn't matter when the cash comes in. It doesn't matter whether it's paid in advance or in arrears. It is, in this particular situation, 
We didn't own the property and let it out until the 1st of July of 21. And that means that through to the end of the tax year, the 5th of April, we will apportion on a monthly basis. That's nine months. That therefore means that we've got nine twelfths of an annual rent of 6,000. As I say, on the accrual basis, when those due dates fell, whether in advance, in arrears, it doesn't matter. This, within the tax year, this property was rented out for nine months. Therefore, nine twelfths of the annual rental is what was uh, due, and that is what is included within your assessment calculation. Expenses incurred, that means both the redecoration cost of 300 and the repairs, because it had been incurred, the work had been done in the 21-22 tax year. Therefore, giving you a total of 800, take it away from your 4,500, and you get your assessment of 3,700 pounds. Remember, again, with that being instructed to follow the accruals basis, it will be the cash basis that you're looking at. We've already said several times the dates that you're looking for, the information that is relevant. OK, back to our notes now. And as we suggested earlier, in terms of the number of items that you've got to deal with, it's going to be the expenses that is your major difficulty. There could be a list of several different items of expense. And for each, knowing it is the paid basis that we're going to use, but we need to establish whether or not those expenses that were paid are allowable within our tax year to be deducted from the rental income received. So what do we know about these deductions? Again, as I said, we're treating it in business terms here. But to be allowable, an expense must be uh, incurred. And these are the, this is the same rule as you'll see in Chapter 4 for trading. It must be incurred wholly and exclusively in connection with the business. And the sort of typical examples of such allowable expenses that we'll see would be it's a property, that's a valuable asset, you'll insure it. So there'll be an insurance cost, again, on a paid basis. All of these on a paid basis. There will be agent's fees. Rather than you managing the receipt and the property, you know, looking after getting the money in, sorting out the work that needs to be done in terms of repairs, etc., you may employ managing agents. And you'll pay them, of course, a fee. And that's usually some percentage, say 10% of the rental income is the expense that you incur in relation to paying the managing agent for looking after the property so you don't have to have the hands-on approach in terms of dealing with tenants, making sure you get the money in, responding to any queries about the property in terms of repairs that need to be done, you hand that over to, of course, the managing agent. And they charge a fee for the work that they do. Of course, what you'll also then have to do is to pay for the relevant expense. If something needs to be repaired, then that is going to be down to you. So repairs and redecoration work may be done. There may be other management expenses, if we can call them that, for example, cleaning expenses. Again, routinely, when one tenant leaves a property, there may be a gap of a few days, uh, in which case what you would organise is for uh, cleaning work to be done. Again, making sure that the property is fit for purpose in terms of a new tenant coming in to that property. Where you'd see it rather more than that, would be in a section that we come to a little later in this chapter, referred to as furnished holiday lettings, where it's not just a residential property that you let out to a tenant who has that for six months, 12 months, 24 months, whatever it might be, but you're now dealing with a holiday property where people come for a few days, a couple of weeks. So within any tax year, there may be dozens and dozens of different uh, occupants of that particular property. And between each occupancy, 
each, uh, again, holiday maker coming to live, but each tenant for you coming to spend time in your property. You've got to clean that property out. So it's been particularly true, of course, to the dreadful pandemic that we've all endured there. So cleaning expenses would be a perfectly allowable expense. There may be some motor expenses incurred. If you are looking after the property yourselves, you go around to, uh, again, have an inspection of the properties on a regular basis. For motor expenses incurred, the taxpayer may now use something we'll look at in Chapter 9 when dealing with employment income and where an individual uses his or her own car in relation to work that they do for their employer. That work may then be, that mileage rather, may then be reimbursed. The, the employer should not be expecting the employee to incur their own uh, motor expenses in relation to what is work done for that employer. Going out from their place of work to visit a client, for example, going and working in a different part of the country. So all of those issues that's dealt with within Chapter 9. But what you'll learn in Chapter 9 and what is stated here is if you do get reimbursed by the employer for the, prior, sorry, for the mileage that you do in your private car, then there is a set rate of 45 pence per mile that is an allowable amount of reimbursement and does not create, therefore, any further assessment in relation to what has been paid to you by the employer. And that 45 pence per mile figure is used here. So if you were told in a question that during the tax year 21-22, the taxpayer uh, drove 100 miles in relation to looking at the properties to do with those properties, then an allowable deduction would be 100 miles at 45p, so a £45 deduction. And that can be used instead of computing actual motor expenses incurred, which would be a nightmare in terms of the administration of that. Recording all the expenditure you've incurred in relation to motor expenses, recording all the mileage that you've done during the tax year, and how much of that total mileage was in fact then to do with the rental business. Far easier just to use that figure. What uh, is pro probably for most taxpayers who enjoy the benefit of property income, the major expense that they incur is going to be a finance expense. Properties are expensive and unless you've got a huge amount of spare cash that allows you therefore to pay cash when you buy the property, you're going to have to take out a loan to take out a mortgage to allow you to buy that property. Now, once upon a time, all such finance expenses incurred in relation to loans taken out to buy or improve the property would simply have been an allowable expense, which might sound perfectly reasonable. This, therefore, might sound unreasonable. They changed that system some years back and don't worry, there's a separate note in relation to this coming up shortly. They changed the system by which we get tax relief for the finance expense, the loan interest that we pay in relation to such borrowings to buy or to improve the property. So yes, we do get tax relief in relation to such interest expense incurred, but it is not in relation to, it's not treated as an expense in determining the net rental income assessment. Instead, what it will be is a tax credit relief that is provided to the taxpayer. How that works is the subject, as we see here, of a separate note, section three below. But in relation to a residential property, commercial property is different. It's still an allowable business expense. But in relation to residential property, it is not an allowable expense. So you do not deduct it from your rental income in working out the net rental income assessment. Instead, 
there will be a reduction in your tax liability. It will be a tax credit that shows up here rather than a liable expense. Next category of allowable deductions here. Capital expenditure is not allowable. So what we've got to do is to differentiate between what is an improvement, what is capital expenditure, which is not allowable, and what is a revenue expense, which is allowable. And that would mean that repairs are allowable revenue expenses, returning the property back to a normal working condition there. But improvements are capital and therefore disallowed. So you've got to read the question carefully in relation to such expenditure to determine whether or not it is simply a repair or does it represent enhancement and improvement expenditure. If it's capital expenditure, then it's not allowable here in determining your property income assessment. You will, however, still eventually get tax relief for that capital expenditure. Because when you sell this property, you will hope to sell it for more than you paid for it. And that pro profit, that capital gain that you make in relation to that sale, that will be picked up, of course, with a capital gains tax. But when you compute that capital gain, you will take away from your sales proceeds, proceeds all of the allowable expenses, capital costs that you've incurred. And that would include any such capital expenditure here. As a separate issue to that, there may be something called capital allowances, we'll talk about that later, that may be claimed for expenditure on plant and machinery used for the maintenance of the property. So you may therefore do the gardening in relation to that property. And therefore you buy a lawnmower, you buy other plant and equipment to tend that garden. So there may be plant and machinery that you buy that is not in relation to your own private use, but is in relation to that particular business property. In which case, capital allowances they, they are the means by which HMRC provide tax relief for qualifying capital expenditure, which will be qualifying plant and machinery here. The way in which HMRC give tax relief for that capital expenditure incurred. What you'd normally expect in a business to see, as we'll see in Chapter 4 and then Chapter 5 that follow, that when you buy plant and machinery, you would have a depreciation charge that goes through the accounts. But that would not be an allowable expense. Instead, the original costs that you incur may then be eligible, if it's qualifying plant and machinery that is bought, for capital allowances. So capital allowances represent the way that HMRC do give tax relief for capital expenditure incurred there on plant and machinery used for the maintenance of the property. When dealing with residential lettings, what we may do is to either let them unfurnished, which is often the case in, and more often the case in real life, but they may be either partly or fully furnished rather than simply unfurnished. In which case, tax relief is usually given for the furniture and furnishings by something called replacement furniture relief. Now don't worry about the name of that, it's simply indicative of how and when you get tax relief in relation to the furniture and furnishings that are bought in relation to the property. And what it means is that there is no relief for the initial cost. This is replacement furniture relief. So there's no relief for the initial cost of your furniture and furnishings. There is only relief, let's give it like that. There is only relief here when the assets are 
replaced. So when you first set that property up in relation to if it was an empty property and you first set that up, the initial expenditure that you incur is not going to attract relief. But when you replace it, that is what will then be entitled to tax relief. But then there's a few other rules in terms of how much of that replacement furniture cost will be allowable for taxation purposes. What will be involved, of course, it will include furnishings such as carpets and curtains, electrical equipment, again, all your white goods, your fridges and freezers and washing machines, etc., TVs, and even cutlery and crockery there. But the amount of relief is reduced by any proceeds from selling the old asset. So that will be deducted. What you've got back on the sale of the old one will be deducted from the cost of the replacement one. Proceeds from something that which has been replaced and relief is not given for any cost which represents an improvement. For example, if a fridge was to be replaced with a fridge freezer, then that clearly is an upgrade. And if it's an upgrade, we're not going to have all of that cost allowed. Instead, and you've got to be given this information in the exam, so it's not difficult. The number is there. In real life, you've got to sort out a validation of the number. But will only be the cost of an equivalent fridge that qualifies for relief. It's a like-for-like -like basis that they work on. So you couldn't therefore just buy a very cheap item to begin with and then come in a little later and buy a really expensive one and get all of that tax relieved. It must be on a like-for-like -like basis. This replacement furniture relief, however, although applicable to furnished lettings, does not apply in relation to furnished holiday lettings. We mentioned furnished holiday lettings a little while ago, and what we'll discover is that there, because it is very different to the letting of property to a long-term tenant, there are some special rules that apply to it. Here's one of them, replacement furniture relief does not apply. Reason being, because the cost of furniture and furnishings in such properties qualify for capital allowances. And again, we'll see the note on that on furnished holiday lettings in section four a little bit later on. Relief is available for revenue expenditure incurred before letting commenced. Obviously, before a tenant can go in, uh, the property may need to be painted, uh, windows repaired if they're broken. Again, a lock may be broken, it needs a replacement lock. There's an amount of work that may need to be done prior to actual the letting period. This is not a problem. It will apply the same basic rules as we apply when you set up a new trade, where again, you'll need to incur expenditure before you can actually start trading. You need to buy things before you can actually start to trade. That expenditure is going to be allowable. It's just a basic rule here. It refers to pre-trading expenditure. And here these trading, the pre-trading uh, expenditure rules apply, means that expenditure incurred up to seven years prior to renting is treated as being incurred on day one of the letting business. So it's allowable. You're going to see in, in, as in real life stuff that's been incurred in the weeks and months leading up to the letting of that particular property. But just because it was incurred, it was paid for prior to you, the actual starting to let that property out and income being derived, it's not a problem. That is still going to be an allowable expense. And to that end, therefore, you've now got, well, here's a bigger and better example, number two, whereby the requirement to calculate the property income assessment, again, of course, for our tax year. What have we got? Sid owns a furnished property. Again, that is relevant to us. Let out at an annual rent of £9,600, payable monthly in advance. 
due in the year 2122, made the following payments. Now again, unless we are told to the contrary, and you will not be so told here, it is the cash basis that we use, not the accruals basis. So we're given the dates made the following payments. We're given the dates here of when these payments were made. We want to know what was actually paid in our 2122 tax year. And we then got to establish whether or not we are talking in terms of allowable expenditure or non-allowable expenditure. You will have to make that decision. Further notes to this. The tenant vacated the property during June 2021 without having paid the rent due for June. Sid was unable to trace the defaulting tenant, but managed to let the property to new tenants from the 1st of July. So we've got one month of June where there was no rental income. The rule here is that that will be an allowable expense. It will be an allowable deduction effectively there. So although, and again, the basis being, as the rental income was not received, it means you're going to get automatic bad debt relief here. Over to you, therefore. Have a little go at uh, our example two. And then, of course, as ever, we'll go through the answer to it when you've completed. So pause now, please. OK, so let's see how we've got on there for just working from the question to begin with. We knew the annual rent was 9,600 payable monthly in advance. But down here for one month, we didn't receive that particular rent. So in terms of our basis, it's an actual received basis. So we do get relief for the fact that they didn't come in. It's what we don't get assessed on it. That would be an issue under the accruals basis. But again, even under the accruals basis, tax relief would be provided in relation to such bad debts. But here, only 11 months of the 12 months, for which it's £9,600, would be the rental income received. We then want the exp uh, expenses paid for during our tax year. So we check out the dates. May 21, June 21, November 21, January 22, all in our 21-22 tax year. But not May 22, it doesn't matter when that work was completed. That would only be an issue as we saw earlier when dealing with the accruals basis. And that's not the issue here. So we've got those four items. Now, a couple of them are very straightforward. Insurance costs. It doesn't matter what the period covered is. All that matters is the amount that was actually paid. The period to which it relates your insurance year doesn't matter. What did you pay in the tax year? Drain clearance there. That's a repair. Must be very dirty drains. Uh, uh, a huge blockage we're talking in terms of £380. That again is a perfectly allowable expense paid for within the year. Go back to the first one here. Construction of a garage replacing a carport. Now, maybe you know, this is what a carport is. In those in depth, it's just basically a cover over on the side of the house under which you park your car. It's a very cheap item indeed, just to try and keep it dry. That's about it, a carport. A garage, now then, that's a very different deal. So what you've clearly got here is that that garage as compared to the carport, is an improvement. It is therefore capital expenditure, and that means that it would not be allowable against the property income for the tax year in which you were paid that particular amount. Instead, what will happen here in relation to this property, when eventually you come to sell it, one of the allowable costs to deduct from your sales proceeds to establish the otherwise chargeable gain that would be subjected to CGT will be that construction cost, that capital cost of £2,000 there. That's capital. You will get tax relief for it, but not in income tax. That will be in capital gains tax. And the last one that's relevant to us is this new cooker. So we're talking replacement furniture relief. What is it replacing? So it actually cost £550 there. It's a new cooker with integrated microwave oven. 
Marvellous. Replacing a cooker sold for fifty pounds. A replacement cooker would have cost three hundred. So again, we can only base the replacement furniture relief on the replacement cost of an equivalent item. And they've got to tell you that. And there it is, it's 300. But also, we have a further deduction from it then to apply, because the old cooker was sold for 50 pounds. So whatever you get back on the old one, that goes against the cost of, or the allowable cost of your replacement, that being, of course, the allowable cost of what would be an equivalent item compared to the item being replaced. So looking at the answer, we've got our 11 months of rental income received. We've got our replacement furniture relief there, the £300 that would be paid in relation to an equivalent item of replacement, minus the £50 proceeds on the old one sold. So that's allowable. The normal routine expenses of insurance and drain clearance there are allowable. Get the total, deduct, and you've got your property income assessment. And again, we've got a few clarifying notes that we just discussed, of course, when dealing with that answer. So might have been an issue about that uh, capital stroke revenue. What do we mean by a car port? Uh, again, hopefully you now see that the garage is a very different beast to simply a bit of roofing across side of the house under which you park your car. This is no doubt that that is a capital cost. It's improvement expended to, and therefore it's not an allowable expense here. Just go back to your notes for one moment before we close on this first session. And that is, we sort of assumed, haven't we, and it's hopefully the case in real life, that the rental income received will be greater in any tax year than the expenses that have been paid out. But that doesn't always work out. Sometimes there is a lot of expense that is incurred in relation to that property. In which case, what happens if the expenses paid exceed the amount of rental income that we have received? That means you have a property loss. And if those total allowable expenses exceed the total rental income, the expenses paid compared to the rental income received, the property income assessment is nil, so you never include on the income tax computation a negative, a bracketed figure there. Instead, if you've made a loss, it could happen here in relation to property income. And as we've mentioned before in uh, uh, previous lectures, when we come to chapter seven, We'll be dealing with businesses that make losses, trading losses, and a variety of different trading loss reliefs there. But the assessment will be nil. That is what's included on the income tax computation. And instead, the excess property loss is carried forward and offset against future property income profits only. So in relation to the property or properties that you rent out, there are more expenses then there is rental income, then the loss. There's only one thing you can do with it. Thankfully, it's not lost, but it will be carried forward to set off against just one thing, future property income profits that arise. So if you're in a question, you've got property income assessment to determine for this particular tax year, and it is a net income figure, but you're told brought forward at the 6th of April at the beginning of the tax year was an unused property income loss of X thousand pounds, then that will be deducted directly from the net property income of this year. Can't go against any other income, only against that property income. OK, that brings this particular session to an end. Join me again next time where we can delve further into the, some of the complexities, indeed, of our property income assessment.